Good evening. One of the most empowering things that ever happened to me was in this very art centre. Uh, 30 years ago, when I had the opportunity to direct Billy Roach's first play, which was called The Boker Poker Club. And I realised, and Billy realised, that something special happened uh, in those weeks, or two weeks, or in my own imagination, those, that run that went on for six months. It didn't. But I imagined that it did. Something happened in the ether, in the air, where I found a voice of my own for the first time. And I really felt that I had become somebody. I felt that I had um, discovered a part of me that was maybe missing. And this was one of the greatest feelings in the world, was that community of coming together with a group of actors, uh, designer, a team of people, and working in that sense of, um, of working together. I, um, I vividly remember going right, right back to when I was maybe five or six, um, going to the Theatre of the South in Cork City, where um, a well-known actor of, of his day, a man called James N. Healy, was playing Pat's Bacock in uh, John B. Keane's play, Sive. This would have been an early production of Sive. And I was in awe, absolutely, I was terrified of this small theatre. And I, I walked in with my dad, and I'm holding his hand. And rather than going into the uh, auditorium, he, he led me backstage, and I nearly died. I'm standing there and I'm looking at these actors, these storytellers, this man who had a, a strong Cork reputation. I'd seen him time and time again. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at him as he's warming up his Bauron to play the part in this play. And I was terrified, but something happened. The smell of the grease paint, literally the smell of the grease paint, because this was a long time ago. The smell of the grease paint and the, the rustle of the crowd on the other side of the footlights and the other side of the curtain. It, it lit something in me, which I haven't been able, fortunately, to, um, to, to shake off. Um, I'm, I'm, and, and this is one of the great things that I have, is the arts and the ability for the arts to be central, front, middle, central, to who I am and what I, I stand for. And it should be the same for others. I, uh, I went to visit a friend of mine when I was little and small, and I was astonished when I walked into his house and discovered that um, there was nothing on the walls. And, and I'm not judging anybody for having anything on the walls or not, but it wasn't part of my DNA. I assumed that the sculpture that would be there or the painting that would be there or the classes that you'd go to, I was assuming that that was a part of what everybody everybody did. And I remember wondering whether this family were in the middle of some kind of reconstruction project. But in fact, I went back again and there was never anything on the walls. There was no story. There were no stories being told. And that just, I couldn't explain it then. And I'm struggling to explain it now. But it occurred to me that there was something maybe that was lacking. The amount of us, the amount of us who uh, engage in extracurricular activities for our children uh, and for our young people is extraordinary. In this country, there are more drama groups, there are more uh, dance classes, there's more feshes, there's more opportunities for young people right across the board for us as soon as class, essentially as soon as school is over, for us to take our kids or our young people and drive them to an art centre or wherever it might be to actually uh, engage in this thing called creativity, this thing called inspiration, this thing, this magic that can enable us to um, find our voice, enable us to sing our song, as it were. I'm, uh, I'm just taken by George Bernard Shaw's imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, you will what you imagine at last, you create what you will. All those extra curricular activities that people are involved in, it's terrific, it's wonderful. There's nothing more exciting than seeing somebody coming back from a class and they've found an energy and a spring in their step and a confidence and a creativity and a, just a life about them. What I'm talking about this evening is that's fine, that's excellent. But what if that extra curricular became intra curricular and that governments and people decided that this thing called the arts stopped being some kind of a kind of a, an apologetic appendage 
it's lovely, you're a good girl, weren't you wonderful in the flesh? And that the arts became central, absolutely central, to how we uh, defined ourselves as a people. Imagine a class, imagine a school where the process of putting together um, an improvisation in which the issues of the day were discussed and analyzed and reflected on in an imagined situation were given the same importance as a maths class or the exploration of, and it happens, indeed it does happen in many schools, but not enough, where, where a teacher is able to, through dance, is able to explore what he or she or her children in that classroom feel about a particular area. Imagine a situation where the arts are put in, intra, in to the middle of, um, of, of our schools. But that's a big, big ask, you know? The whole world is being now designed, redesigned by the people who design worlds. Um, and it's built on these four pillars, the science, the technology, the engineering, and the maths pillars. And we must, we must march to that tune. Uh, we're told time and time again that that's the kind of people we want to produce out there. But there is one thing missing, as you read in today's Irish Times, for example. It's the A, yes, it's the A in STEAM, the arts. The idea that right in the middle of all these STEM subjects, that in there, there's a fuse that can be lit. There's a spark that can be uh, ignited, which in fact fuels exactly where a society needs to go. Because without them, a science and a, a technology and an engineering and a maths, they're fine, but they can't and shouldn't exist on their own. And where is the responsibility? Of course, it comes with government. We're going to hear that all the time at talks like this. Where are the government? What are the government doing? The people who design the curriculum need to take responsibility and take an understanding. They have children of their own. Why do they not see that their children are better when they are inspired, are more imaginative when they're engaged in a creative conversation? When do they know and understand that things might need to shift and things might need to change? Because it concerns me more than I can say. If the curriculum assessment people start to understand, and if you know them, talk to them. If the curriculum assessment people know the value, the imperative, the importance of singing that song or lighting that spark or engaging in that conversation creatively, if those people do that and understand that it's vital and important, then imagine a Department of Education who did it and imagine a government who actually changed the axis of how we produce our, uh, our, our young people, change the axis so that the arts are, an, are, are a part of and are allowed to be a part of, uh, of what, we, what we do. I'm talking with Eamon Sinnott in Intel, Wexford man, extraordinary visionary man holding this massive project on his shoulders. And he says the nature of all problems we tackle require increasingly creative people to solve them. And the intersection between the creative arts and the traditional STEM areas will be at the core of the problem solvers of the future. And the skill of the workforce of the future will depend as much on curiosity, creativity, and design as it would technical apt aptitude. If, if we're not enabling and encouraging and empowering our young people in schools to be right there, right there at the cutting edge, then we're going to find ourselves running out of time. Of course, Steve Jobs often spoke about technology, marrying it with the liberal arts, marrying it with the humanities, and that's where the heart gets a chance to sing. Indeed, um, President Obama, the future belongs to young people with an education and the imagination to create. The writing is on every single wall in town, yet somehow those who create the country that we live in, those who design the curriculums, don't seem to be capable or confident enough in themselves to actually change that axis, because it's an axis, in my view, that needs to be shifted onto. We are a storied people living in a storied landscape. For goodness sake, the Irish, the Irish, the luck of the Irish, the glory of the Irish. One of the great things that we are is this great nation of storytellers. You know, Riverdance is 25 years old. It's great. You too celebrate their 40th birthday this day, this week. 
that's great. There are other ways in which we can define ourselves, and we need to bring a whole new energy to the table if we are to find ourselves allowing, enabling, encourage the artist of the future to play their part. Because our stories and how we tell them are a part of our DNA and our vocabulary of how we reflect who we are. There isn't a person who doesn't want to hear a story from a grandmother to a grandchild. Or there isn't a person who wants to discuss and explore through a dance performance or a drama or whatever it might be, how we reflect ourselves. There's a big danger that we're running out of road because we, we, we will become unable, perhaps, we'll be unable to reflect ourselves. Shakespeare calls it the mirror being held up to nature. And if that mirror is no longer able to be held because we're too rigid in what we have to do, then I think and fear we're in trouble. So perhaps it involves some agitation. Perhaps it involves going from here and actually speaking to and scratching on doors and knocking on doors and asking people if they might consider changing a mindset. Because unless our education system changes its mindset, we're in danger of, uh, of running out a road. I kind of think that probably the best thing to end on is asking you to uh, make a little bit of noise and let the wild rumpus start. Thank you very much. <laughs>